Thank you, Pastor Mike. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it and look forward to some exciting conversations and information from Family Promise on what their new objectives are and the different activities that are going forward right now for Family Promise. I've been involved in Family Promise for about well, over, I think, 15 years, and there have been many, many changes in the way that we have gone about supporting these families that are in insecurities. And um, so I want to just quickly tell you that you're going to hear a lot of information and there's a lot of new and exciting changes that are going on and a lot of opportunities for us to help out with Family Promise. Um, so for Zion this year, we have a few things that we are doing to support Family Promise and I just want to let you know what those are. We do hospitality baskets four times a year. Monday is our next event that we do, um, and I will be distributing those baskets tomorrow. And then we have meal train, which Zion is uh, asked to help create uh, meals and deliver meals to like three or four families right now that are involved in that prop that program. Um, those are not necessarily the same families that are receiving the hospitality baskets. And you can go online and volunteer to deliver the baskets or the uh, food to those people. We also have done move-in baskets. And that just consists of a bunch of cleaning um, things for people that are just moving into their new place. The church does an annual donation. We have tables at the spring and the fall events, and the new fall event is Homeless for Hot Dish, and that's on October 3rd. If anyone is interested, we do have tables for Zion that are available, and we'd love to have anybody come to it. Um, and then we also have budgeting mentors, who Carol's just filling her mouth, which is great. Um, she <laughs> is the one who is our well, kind of the runner of the budget mentor program and um, so if anyone's interested in helping out with that she'll be here to ask and answer any questions and that's what we've done and that's what we hope to do in 2025 as well we are looking for volunteers to help out with the program more and to support it so with that I will turn it over to David Fry David is the leader of Family Promise and he's going to give you all kinds of information thanks David thank you and thanks to all of you for coming today, for uh, being here to um, hear about uh, the work that we do, but it's really the work that we do together as a community. Family Promise is a, a community response to homelessness and housing insecurity in our county, and uh, we can't do that without the support of, of all sorts of people like you. Um, a lot of you have been involved with Family Promise for a long time in, in a number of different ways, and so some of the stuff I'm going to share uh, is stuff that for you is uh, how you have experienced working with Family Promise before. Some of you uh, may have never been involved before. How many of you have been involved in some way with Family Promise before? Excellent. Because here's the other thing. We have a lot of new stuff that's going on, a lot of changes, and even uh, you guys will be the first ones that are getting to see uh, some of the new drawings a little bit later of uh, what it is that we'll be building. But I uh, don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I just want to give a little bit of a brief history of uh, who we are and what we do and how we uh, came to be started. Uh, Family Promise is an organization that focuses on families in Anoka County with minor children um, who are experiencing housing insecurity. And what we do is we work to help them uh, build a foundation of lasting independence. And there are a lot of different ways that we can do that, a lot of different tools, and we will get into that too. Um, the people that we serve is uh, families that are Anoka County residents uh, with minor children who may be experiencing or could soon be experiencing homelessness here in Anoka County. That sounds really simple, but sometimes uh, the definitions get a little bit hazy there. Uh, what does it mean to be a resident of Anoka County if you're experiencing homelessness, right? So then we have some ways that we look into, are they tied to Anoka County? Are they tied to a different county um, where they're getting assistance and things like that? Uh, even a question of, um, do you have minor children can be tricky um, because maybe you have custody for part of the time or maybe the kids are staying with somebody else while you're trying to find a place to live. And so uh, even that question can be hazy. So it seems straightforward uh, who we work with, but it's never quite that easy. 
Um, but the way that we used to serve, um, and the way that uh, I should point out too that Family Promise is part of a network of about 200 other Family Promise affiliates across the country. Each of us is a uh, separate nonprofit. We run our own show, um, but we work together with, with affiliates across the country also for best practices, for learning, uh, for new ideas, and for support. Um, but almost all Family Promise affiliates started as a network of local congregations um, who provide overnight shelter, space, uh, hospitality, and meals uh, for a week at a time and do that uh, in a, on a rotation basis. So Zion did that for a whole lot of years. Uh, right from the beginning, Zion had families staying down here. Fam uh, the meals would be served in here. And then uh, the rooms would be through the accordion doors over there where families were. Um, and uh, right up to the end, Zion was serving that way. And the reason I say right up to the end, it was midweek during COVID, the families were, were here. Um, and it, the, uh, the, the church was saying, you know, we can get you through this week. We will make it. We're working forward. Um, but the local government and the state government uh, had different ideas. And also the idea of um, needing to protect both our families and our volunteers from a spread of COVID that at the time was, was pretty dangerous. Uh, we had to change our, our format and what we were doing. We'd been serving families in that rotation format for just, uh, just under 10 years, and that was pretty exciting. That's how I got started with Family Promise. I'm a member at Faith Lutheran in Coon Rapids, and uh, I had started um, kind of accidentally, and this might be the case for a lot of you with uh, how you got involved with Family Promise. I used to lead our uh, Wednesday night uh, worship service for the, the confirmation teams, and we were there to practice uh, the week after Labor Day to get ready for confirmation starting the next week. And uh, they needed some help with moving some, some fake walls in the, in the uh, gym because they had double booked and wanted to be able to keep some space for the families to be, uh, be able to have some privacy while the church was overflowing with parents and kids that were there for meetings. Uh, so I got hauled in there just to move some walls. And next thing you know, um, I'm also uh, staying overnight. I'm helping with mealtime. I'm playing with kids in the afternoon. I'm driving the bus to get people back and forth from the church to the day center. And then I end up on staff and the executive director. And so um, that's how things snowball when you're volunteering with Family Promise sometimes. Um, and some of you may have had an experience like that too. Uh, but everything changed uh, with COVID. Um, but one of the things before I go on to that too, is that uh, we had already been looking as an organization at some change. We had recognized that there were some uh, weaknesses with that rotation model. It's a really great way to do it at a relatively low cost um, because it's a lot of volunteers and none of the volunteers get overworked because you're overworked for a week at a time uh, and then you have yeah, you wait basically until the next quarter before you do it again. So, so it's just uh, your time comes up, you do it again, and then you move forward. It was really difficult for the families, though. Um, a lot of families it couldn't work for. Uh, people would have to sometimes decide whether or not um, they could take a new job that was going to pay them a lot more money or if they had to stay in our program because if they were working overnight, um, we didn't have a way to help them. If they had odd hours and they were a single parent, um, the whole childcare situation was messy. It was also very exhausting for the families. And so we started looking in 2017 at different models that would be more stable for the families, give them an opportunity to have a place to be, and the volunteers would come to them, uh, which we called a static site model instead of a rotation. COVID came along and uh, changed things up a little bit. And so we had to stop doing the rotation before we were ready for the next step. And so we started providing shelter through extended stay hotels. We did get a grant through the state to help us do that, which we're continuing to do to this day. Um, the case management and other services continue to be provided. And, uh, and that is an exciting thing um, that we were able to be able to continue um, supporting families throughout COVID that way. In a lot of places, a lot of states that didn't happen. Um, and so Family Promise affiliates really struggled with how they could continue to serve families with that way. Soon we'll be putting together a campus that will allow us to have the permanent housing space and a more accessible service center. So uh, this is one of the exciting things on your table. You probably have a card that says we've moved. Um, just at the end of last year, we transitioned into our new space on Coon Rapids Boulevard. We used to be housed at a house in Lord of Life Church property um, up in Ramsey, which was a long ways out from the bus line. Uh, it was a difficult place for families to get to and from, and it, ca it caused a lot of time to be used up uh, to get there and back. 
by moving into this new space on Coon Rapids Boulevard, uh, we're right off a bus line. We have a lot more walk-in people, and we have a space that is set up to be able to handle uh, people coming in and doing that kind of stuff. We've also been able to add a lot of other services along the way too with our prevention and our stabilization programs, uh, which means that we start working with families even before they are experiencing homelessness to make sure it doesn't happen to them. And that new space is allowing us to have a center to do a lot more of that work as well too. And then we have a stabilization program that helps families that have either completed our prevention or our, our shelter programs to stay housed so that they don't go through an episode of homelessness again. Uh, if you look at on your table, uh, there's only one of these per table, Community Impact Report. Um, that gives some information on the services that we provided in 2013. Uh, one thing that I would love to call your attention to is that we served 237 unique individuals across all of our programs last year. And that was a record for us. Um, prior to COVID, when we only had our shelter model and we were rotating three families at a time, um, our, our record for number of people served was just under 100 in a year. And so uh, last year we served 237 unique individuals. One thing that's really exciting is that by the end of September, we, this year, we will have already passed that number for this year. So the number of families that we're able to serve keeps growing. This move into the new space has allowed us to open up the space and our programs to more people. And uh, we continue to be able to grow those in new and exciting ways. The biggest growth for us has been in our prevention program. Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can help with that as well too, which I'll get to um, toward the end when I have a whole list of things that you could do uh, to help families in our community. Um, but that's just one of the exciting things on here um, that is there. Uh, I wanna share some exciting stuff that isn't on the table there necessarily. And that is to talk a little bit about our campus. So uh, Coon Rapids Boulevard is this one right here. And uh, 610 Bridge is over here. And the University 47 is down this way. And so then right up north of here is where the uh, 610 to 10 freeway overpasses. So just so that you have an idea of where it is, um, the in-town suites where some of our families are staying is the hotel just across the street there. So, so you have an idea of where we are. This building here is our new family service center right there on Coon Rapids Boulevard. Um, and if you drive by, you see it. We have a nice sign out front that shows where it is, but that's only the tip of the iceberg because uh, thanks to a grant from Anoka County, we were able to get all of this property that's highlighted in yellow. So we have the, our, our center, that's our, our family service center, where our offices are, where the families come to meet. This is our public facing one. We also have a house here that we have a family that is moving out of that into permanent housing today is their move out day. So that's exciting. Uh, then we'll be able to turn that house over and get another family in there so that we can serve some larger families that wouldn't fit in a hotel space. But we have all this open space. And the idea with that is that we can put up something um, that will serve as the shelter space, the housing for families in our shelter program. Uh, and so we've been working on that. Um, the process started actually back in 2018 with some uh, work with our guest advisory council, which is people who uh, have been in our program before, um, with some of the, uh, so those are former guests of our program, with uh, some volunteers, with some builders, with researching other programs and stuff. And, and what we, dis we discovered is that if we focus on the experience of the kids in the program, is that uh, we can create a space that is new and different from anything else that we found across the country. Um, we are designing our space so that our program and our space focus on the experience of the kids in an odd way that they don't even have to know that they are part of our program. So we're, we're trying to make it as normal as possible for the kids and that means uh, creating a space that matches up with that. Um, so what we've done is we have proposed a space um, and it has now just as of last week was accepted by the city of Coon Rapids, a site plan uh, that allows us to build an eight unit apartment building. It'll have the other services there too, um, but eight, unit, eight apartment units in it that will be used as the housing for families in our program. So they'll have the ability to cook for themselves. They'll have their own space that they can secure for themselves. Uh, that means that they can have odd working times. They can come and go as they need to for their family's needs. And they can still meet their family's uh, cultural needs as far as food and things like that goes themselves. We'll be able to help them get the food that they need to cook. Um, and we also have cooking programs that are available to help them learn how to do that if that isn't something that is a strength of theirs. 
So if you look on this property here, again, our Family Service Center is down here. That's where we are now. Um, Bill and Marie, for instance, helped us get into there with a whole lot of elbow grease and legwork and lifting and painting and cleaning. Um, and we're in there now. Uh, our next phase is building this one. As I showed you, the house is right here. These are just holding spaces to show you that once this is built and we're ready to go, uh, we can start looking at what we'll do with the north end of the property as well. So we have further space to grow in the future. Uh, but we wanted to create a space that wouldn't look like a shelter, that wouldn't feel like a shelter, that would fit in with the neighborhood. And so uh, working with the architects, with our guest advisory council of what that might be, I'm going to show you some of the plans here. Um, an exterior view here uh, is something that is meant to look like it's kind of just a couple of houses there. It's a two-story building. It's got a pretty tall roof line, but otherwise, um, you know, it looks very nice but nondescript. The idea is that when the bus, when the buses come to pick up the kids for school in the morning is that it's not going to be saying family promise shelter, you know, a big neon sign flashing that says this family that we're picking up is homeless. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is have a dignified space that when the kids are going, getting on and off the bus, um, nobody on that bus has to know. The kids themselves don't even have to know that their family is part of a homelessness program. So uh, that is kind of the outside view. I'm going to show you some new stuff that is, uh, let's see. The floor plan of uh, what we're looking to do. So we're going to have eight units. Uh, this is the first floor. And, but there are a few things that are really exciting to me about this as well, because it's not just an apartment building. It's not a traditional shelter, but it's also not a traditional apartment building. If we start on this side, you can see that we have this whole section over here. It's kind of like public space. And what we have is we have a community room that can fit up to about 60 people. This is where we can have meals. Uh, all the people that are staying here, plus uh, future expansion to the north, or if we have people still staying at the hotel, which might be uh, something we have to do. Um, uh, in addition, but this space here, we can have rooms, we can have our educational classes, we can have activities and fun things for families to do, and we also have a commercial kitchen that'll be going in. Because part of uh, getting back to a rotation with churches like yours is that opportunity to have some meals in person that you can serve and work with the families each week. And so we might only be doing three meals a week with the families that are the public meals, but that would be an opportunity for you to do that. You you could make them here or at home and bring them in or uh, use our kitchen that's there. And so we're excited for that. Um, and then we have a play area built in. We have this entrance, but otherwise we can close the rest of it off so we can use this for people even outside of who's staying in the apartment for some of the programming. But then we have apartments. And these are very small. They're efficiency units. Uh, the city of Coon Rapids allows for this in their code, which was really lucky for us. It's a, it's a little bit... Uh, more forgiving because it's based on the size of the unit, how many people can be there versus the number of bedrooms in the unit. So these are efficiency units of different sizes. Uh, we have units that can take up to eight people. Um, and so in the first, the units on the first floor here are both uh, fully ADA compliant. So that would be people with mobility issues or um, disabilities in different ways. Uh, we could have two families that fit into that category. We have laundry available. We also have an office and a staff storage space. These are so that our case managers can meet with the families over there instead of having them come across the street. So if the kids are upstairs sleeping or something like that, no problem, we'll meet you over here. Um, but each of the apartments has a bathroom and a very small kitchen. It has a den that is a bedroom where we assume that the kids would go and then a bed in the main area. This is likely to be a Murphy bed kind of setup so it can be put away each night if they want to um, because that's also the eating area. So uh, these units are small. Um, they are though dignified and they're a way that the families will be able to uh, um, have their own space that they can do. I'll just show you the upstairs here, if I can find where my cursor is. So the upstairs you can see is very similar. We have one very large room here. We have another one that has a little bit of a different shape to it. So that can be for a little bit larger families, but then otherwise it is, uh, well, it's the two, sorry, two big rooms upstairs that are convertible. And then the other ones are these, uh, uh, similar size ones. So we have the ability to do families from two up to eight in this in this building here. Um, and those large families are ones that uh, shelters often struggle with. So we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of space in our design to be able to make that kind of thing happen. 
Um, let me see if I can bring it down. Yep, so uh, if you just kind of see what it is that we're hoping to do, that's really exciting. Um, and so you're probably wondering how it is that we're able to do this. Uh, and that's a great question. <laughs> We, uh, we managed to get a grant from the state of Minnesota to cover most of the cost of this, of this project. Um, the state of Minnesota doesn't recognize the rotational shelter as a shelter um, because of the difficulty that it has for the families. So any organization that uses rotation, they try to help move out of that. Well, luckily for us, um, the state had some money to spend. You might have heard last year about this $18 billion surplus that was going on. Well, they decided to put some of that toward homelessness. So about two dozen organizations like ours across the state are doing projects of varying size. Ours apparently is one of the bigger ones um, to be able to increase space um, and to do it in a way that is dignified. And also they're hopeful that someday we'll all as a society get our act together and figure out how to manage this homelessness thing and that this won't need to be used as a shelter anymore. So they wanted to know, how can this space be used in the future? Well, we're building an apartment building. That's pretty easy to move on uh, and to do something else with. Um, they wanted to make sure that we were able to uh, manage during another um, pandemic or crisis of, of uh, health thing. Well, with each of the families having their own space and the ability to cook inside it, um, we might stop serving uh, community meals during a major event like that, but we could still bring meals to their rooms and they could cook for themselves. So we have that nailed too. So um, we had a really good application there. Uh, we are in the process right now of hiring our general contractor. We just met with them last week. Like I said, we got the approvals, the final approvals from the city of Coon Rapids. So the project can move forward. Then we just need to get building permits, hire our contractor and get started. And that's really exciting, except that uh, in the meantime, the prices of everything have gone up a bit. And so we do now have what we had all of our money lined up and ready to go before. We do now have some more that we need to pick up. Um, two reasons for that. One is that the, uh, uh, to keep it really short, as far as the drainage on the site goes, the stuff to the south can't go to the storm sewer because of the shape of the property and where the storm sewer stuff is. So we had to add a um, infiltration basin on the property, which is where the storm water runs in and it soaks into the ground. That takes up space. There are a lot of trees on that spot that we were hoping to leave. We have to cut them down, put in this infiltration basin. But then of course the city of Coon Rapids looks at the plan and says, ah, but you don't have enough trees on the property now. So we have to plant those too. So there's a significant added cost that we weren't expecting uh, coming in there, but then also just the cost of, of building and labor and all that has escalated uh, in the last roughly year and a half since we started the process of getting this grant done. All that to say though, we're close. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing some major fundraising to try to get the rest of it done. We're working on uh, setting up a construction loan with our bank so that we can have the cash flow that we need. Uh, to make it happen and we do expect to be breaking ground in April of next year and then it will be roughly one year from the time we break ground to the time that we're able to open the doors to our first family. Um, we promised the state that we would be shooting for Thanksgiving of uh, 2026 um, and the builders kind of laughed at that one because they're like oh uh, you're going to have this thing for a year before you even <laughs> have the families in. So we know we'll be able to beat that number. We don't know exactly when we'll have them in, but it is very likely that uh, two years from now, we will have families uh, living in this building and ready to go. So we are really excited about that. It's uh, transformative in the way that we will be able to serve families. Um, we'll still be having a family able to stay in the house. So an even larger family or a longer term family. So we'll have space for nine families on the site here. We're hoping to keep funding with the state to keep one or two families in the hotel as a transition so we can bring them into the hotel before bringing them in here if they're in their car um, or if there's a reason that they can't stay in that building like uh, maybe a criminal history or something like that that wouldn't allow them to have a leased space there uh, with other kids around but there would be an opportunity in the hotel. So we have the ability on this property alone to get up to nine families at a time uh, which is a big jump for us. So uh, I do have, I can take a lot more questions on that afterwards, but I just want to make sure that we get through all this stuff so that if you have questions, uh, you can ask me. If you don't have questions, you can move on to whatever it is with the rest of your day. Um, but we do have, oops, I'm on the wrong. There we go. So, uh, 
Just wanted to bring up a few things to you. I already told you about the impact report. We also have a card that shows the three main programs that we do. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we hand out in the community. So I would encourage you to take this one with you. And if you maybe keep it in your car, and if you run into somebody who looks like they're struggling um, with it, maybe they're, they have the sign out that says, homeless, please help us. Hand them this because it tells them what we do um, and they can figure out if we're a fit for them or not and it has our contact information. There's a card that shows that we've moved. So uh, we have some people, this has been a real difficult thing for us, people who uh, make donations anonymously to us through a third party. We don't have any way to contact them. So we can contact the third party and say, hey, we have a new address. And they're like, hey, that's great. But the person making the donation has to uh, change the address, not you. And that's problematic for us when it comes anonymously. <laughs> so um, I have these cards out. So if that's you, if you're making a donation or things like that, you have our new address. We have the impact report, uh, which is the thing that talks about all the different things that we've done, the people that we've served, what the finances look like. And we have Hot Dish with Heart, which is our biggest fundraiser of the year. One of the things that's coming up and Hot Dish with Heart will be part of this is we have two different donors that came to us within a week of each other without knowing that the other one even existed and offered us $50,000 of match funding to encourage people to uh, donate. So we were really excited when we got somebody that said, hey, I'd like to put up a challenge of $50,000. And within a week, we got a second one who offered that too. So we put the two of them together to find out that they said, you know, we're going to go end to end instead of together. So $100,000 of matching fund available. We've got to get that done by the end of the year. Any donations that happen at Hot Dish with Homelessness will be doubled. Um, there's a letter that will be going out soon that a lot of you will be getting. Um, those donations will be doubled as well. And so I just encourage you to come to the event, find out more about what we're doing, have a good time. Uh, you can go with other people from the church here. It's a, just a fun event. Um, there's Hot Dish. There won't be Tatered Hot Hot Dish this year. We have a different caterer. Um, but uh, unfortunately, there won't be tater tot hot dish, but there will be other hot dish. Um, but then all donations up to $100,000 will be matched, which is huge for us. Um, just that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to share that with you as well. Um, so of course, funding is one of the ways that you can help. Um, but there are also a lot of other ways too, as Pat had brought up, there are things like the meal train, the hospitality baskets, um, move-in baskets and gift cards. Uh, Move-in baskets are something that our, our congregations do. A lot of times this is a space that Thrive and Action teams work really well for, if you are all familiar with those. Um, and these are the baskets that we give to families when they're moving out of shelter, or some of our prevention families get them too, depending on their situation, um, that have things like a vacuum, cleaning supplies, the stuff that they need for uh, stocking a bathroom, paper products, all that kind of stuff that go to families. Those are move-in baskets. Uh, we use gift cards a lot as incentives for families um, for when people need things for job readiness or things like that too. So if you uh, want to donate that way as well, we can do that. Um, another area that we have, uh, also we have a needs list that we update on Facebook all the time and we keep one online as well. We have in our new Family Service Center a nice big closet. We call it Kathy's Closet, named after one of our uh, volunteers who died recently. Um, and uh, she had a real passion for making sure everybody had what they needed. So we have this closet that we keep stocked with all of the things, cleaning supplies, paper products, diapers, um, deodorant, combs socks, all that kind of stuff that's available for families and they can just kind of come in and shop that closet, take what they need and even pick out the version of everything that they want. Um, so we're always looking for items for that as well. We go through a ton of stuff. That's one of the things with having, um, you know, 250 people a year that we're serving now is that we go through a lot of stuff out of that closet. Um, we had a donation that just filled it overflowing last month. And then within a month, um, the shelves were mostly bare again. So it's, it's a constant recycle event. So if you're uh, ever looking for a way to help there, we need that. Um, but we have some other things that we're looking at too. Um, we have this uh, a newer program that's Budget Mentors. And this is something where an individual like you uh, can get partnered up with a family to have a personal relationship and build up some budgeting work. There's some training that goes with it. Um, and a lot of it is really just being a sounding board and helping uh, a family to talk through the decisions that they have to make financially and things like that. Um, Carol does that. She does a lot of other things too. Um, but if you're interested in having some of that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a family to really help them move forward, um, Carol uh, is helping with that a lot and she'd be happy to talk with you afterwards this about how you might get involved with that. 
Um, but it's a great place to see some real transformations. And we've seen that with some of our families too through that program. Uh, we had a family that um, was coming in. They were really struggling to get to work. It was one that actually Carol worked with. Um, they were really struggling to find work and so she started working with them to really figure out what they might need to do and then our case manager that was working with them uh, helped them to get some clothing and things like that so that, uh, so that the guy could be ready for an interview that was coming up. In the morning of the interview, uh, we got a knock on the door at the Family Service Center and it was someone who I just didn't recognize at all. I didn't know who it was and so I opened up the door and I said, can I help you? And as he said, uh, he just said the first words like, sure, I'm just here too. And I recognized that it was this family we'd been working with. But that was the guy ready for an interview. I had no idea who it was. He had his new clothes on. He had his hair done. You know, he was clean shaven, uh, new shoes, all that kind of stuff. Didn't know who he was at all. And he got that job. Um, and that's the kind of impact in the transformation. Like we can see that transformation in a real way sometimes. You can help make that happen. The Budget Mentor is a great place to do that. And if you have specific skills too that you think that you could bring to the table, um, we're working through that as well too. So budget mentoring doesn't necessarily have career coaching with it, uh, but that's something that Carol does and she loves to do and we've seen an impact in that. So she brings that in their works with some of the families to do that as well. So uh, that's one of those that we have. Um, we, we always need help with uh, renovating space and getting it ready. We have two houses. The day center that we used to use in Ramsey has a family that, of seven that's in it right now that's in our shelter program. Um, our house that I was showing over on that one before has a family that just is moving out today. And so we constantly need some help with every time a family moves out, we need some help with getting it ready for the next family to come in. Um, you know, touch up some paint, make sure it's clean and inviting and ready to come in. Um, we also are always looking for board and committee members. A couple of our newest committees that we're looking to form, we have an HR committee that we need to get started. If that's something that you're interested in, we'd love to talk to you. Also, marketing and communications is an area that we need a lot of help. Um, of course, like I talked about, we are always looking for financial contributions. And uh, I know that you all here are really good with this prayer thing. You do it before every meeting. We'd love to have you pray for us. Uh, continually within that to um, pray for us, pray for the families that we work with and pray especially I would say for the families that we don't get to work with um, because we're out of space or there are other needs that they have that we can't help them with. Um, so that is uh, a helpful thing. And then just share the story of people in the community that we have people struggling and that you recognize that and that uh, uh, you can keep them in your thoughts and prayers but also you know we're in an election cycle. Ask people when they come to your door um, you know, you get somebody knocking on your door and they're like, hey, I'm Brent Campbell, I'm running for city council. You can ask them, you know, what their thoughts are on homelessness and what they would like to do um, to help with that in, in your local community. Um, so that's all that I have to talk about. I want to make sure that we have some time for questions or thoughts or to chase down Carol if you're interested in being a budget mentor or any of that kind of stuff. Yes? You mentioned the... the shortfall in the, in the cost of the increase for the new building. What are we talking about there? Right. Uh, so the question was, um, I, I said that we don't have enough money anymore. Um, we're looking at something that is probably between six hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars and $800,000, um, which is money that we will have to figure out how to raise. We don't know what that number is exactly because once we start working with the general contractor that we did interviews with, they'll be able to zero in on what the, the final actual cost will be. Um, but there are things like insurances and stuff like that, that that are just a lot more expensive than they were two or three years ago um, when we first started looking at it. So uh, six to eight hundred thousand dollars, a good size one. So if you know somebody that has, you know, a good chunk of that sitting around, send them my way. I'd love to love to talk to them. And David, on that note, you said that there was a fundraiser that was coming up specifically for that? Yeah, uh, so uh, we, we're not doing one necessarily specifically for that because uh, we're trying to um, raise funds that will continue us forward as well too with our other programs as well. So uh, we have a pr uh, program or a, a campaign that's coming up called Building the Future, which is focused heavily on this project, but also looking at how, how we're seeing growth in a lot of our other programs in the number of families that we're able to serve and things like that too. So we want to make sure that um, we're able to keep funding all of the programs that we need to do besides just building a building. I used to work in uh, Lutheran summer camps and one of the, the pitfalls that you'd always run into with building projects at the camps is that you would end up moving money out of the general operating funds and into 
the building fund and then you're trying to raise all this money for it and the, the project keeps going on and it gets more expensive and meanwhile your program is suffering um, because because uh, you don't have the funds to do that because there's been money moving toward the building project. Well, we can't afford to do that because what we do is get people housed. Like we don't have the ability to really cut uh, a lot of a lot of fat around the edges there to to make that work to to build this building. So we need to make sure that we're not focused just on this building, but that we're building the futures of the families that are in our program, not the future of Family Promise, not our future buildings. So that's that's kind of why we're keeping it a little bit broader than that. But there will be a letter coming out about that very soon. Um, we had the final draft come to us on Friday, and then it goes to the printers. That'll be coming out roughly the same time that Hot Dish with Heart happens in October. Yes? You were mentioning about you know, refabbing after family gets in there. They have a, a big problem with vandalism because you know some people that's not their place. They don't care about it. Mm -hmm. What happens in a case where a family comes in and trashes like a brand new apartment or something? Are they responsible for this? Or? Yeah. So uh, they do pay. Um, we do have them. The ones that are in the houses do a uh, damage deposit that is a way that they can uh, um, still be paying something out of their their uh, income. It's a way that we're a little bit protected in case that there is some sort of really um, significant damage that we need to correct that is something that they cause because of issues. But it's also a way that we can help force savings uh, so that they're not, so they're ready to move on to the next place because there's money available to them. Uh, what we found is that that's not, it's not intentional is the thing. What it usually is is like in the houses where we have the family staying, these are large families with a lot of kids, and that just puts a lot of pressure on the space. So it, it needs a little extra cleaning, touching up of the paint just from normal wear and tear. We want to make it look uh, new and inviting to every family that's coming in, because if it looks run down and used up, then it's going to get treated as run down and used up, and the families that are living in there are going to feel run down and used up. So that's where we like to have the volunteers that can come in to really make it look like when they walk in the door to their new space, they're like, wow, this is nice. You guys are treating us well, uh, because that's one of the first things that they're going to experience with our program. And if they're saying, wow, this is way better than I expected, they're going to they're going to lean into the program a little bit better. So long answer to your short question. But um, like serious damage isn't something that we've really had to deal with in that way. But we do have a plan for it if, if and when it does happen. <laughs> Yep, um, and so Lord of Life is letting us use it until that happens. Um, and uh, the original thought was that it could be um, two to four years that that house would still be there, that we could use it. Um, but the part of the project that was planned for that spot was rejected by the city council. And so they're going to have to go back to the drawing board for that particular piece of property. So we may be able to use that house for a long time. <laughs> and uh, Lord of Life is happy for us to be able to do that as well, too. So um, yeah, right now we have uh, six families in the hotel. We have two families in those houses. And then we actually are supporting some other families through our prevention program who are in hotels as well, too, currently. Yeah. yeah. When we hosted families here, uh, we had volunteers to stay overnight, volunteers to bring in food. Will that model at all be followed again in the future when they move into this new facility? Right. So the question was, uh, when, when you hosted here, you needed volunteers for everything, to play with the kids, to provide meals, to bring in stuff, to stay overnight, uh, to drive the bus. Some of those jobs, and, and the question is whether or not we'll have some of that in the new facility. Um, the truth is yes and no. Uh, we won't need the bus drivers. We won't need the overnight, uh, the overnight volunteers. We will need people that'll be providing hospitality, and we will be needing some meals and some food and some uh, some activity time. So the the amount of time investment that we'll be asking from each of the congregations when it's their week for rotation. Uh, will be significantly less. We'll be looking at the churches providing two to three meals a week um, for everybody. And then um, uh, having some sort of, one of those might be our educational night, one of those might be an activity night, and one of those might be like Saturday brunch kind of thing that's just kind of a laid back time. Um, an opportunity for you get to, to get to know the families, uh, for them to have a little bit of relief, someone to play with the kids while they're talking to other adults, <laughs> things like that. So like what you got to experience here, but it won't be every night uh, when it's your week to, to host. It'll be a little bit less there. Uh, we will be looking for um, to try to find ways that we can up the 
hospitality side, since the families have their own space, there will be less community uh, between families um, as there was when they were all having to share the bus together and share the same space together. Some of that is really helpful because then we can avoid the conflicts between the families. Um, but some of that just means that they don't know each other as well and stuff. So there will be, we don't know exactly how it will look yet. Um, we're working on some of the program side of it now, but th there will be that need to have some meals provided, but not every night, not every meal. There will be the need for some activities, but we won't need some of that day-to-day uh, -day stuff like the bus drivers and the overnight hosts. Um, d we did design the building in a way that it's an apartment building, which doesn't require 24-7 security person on site the way that a shelter does, because each of the rooms or each of the units has its own locking door. So um, if a family was in, a, in an apartment and will be in an apartment, and they're currently in an apartment, now why does this one need babysitting overnight? Um, we don't. Uh, it saves a lot of money as far as having to have the 24-7 staffing. Overnight hosts were the hardest thing generally for most churches to find. And so we are avoiding having that part of it. But also, if a family can't handle being in there without somebody babysitting them, then they, they aren't ready for our program yet. And we'll find a different family who would be. So, yes? Our financial contributions tax-free? Yes, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so all, all, uh, all contributions and donations um, you can uh, claim on your taxes. Assume that you do them the correct way, we get you, a, a, you know, the receipt letter and all that kind of stuff too, yep. So, yes? Has anybody checked to see like maybe lumber yards or plumbing, HVAC? that they could do a reduced cost for supplies? Uh, yes, so we have a couple things. One is because uh, this is where some of that, that uh, slush in the, um, what's that? Oh yes, good question. The, the question was, very good idea. The question was, um, are there ways that we can partner with uh, HVAC companies or supply places to lower the cost of our, of our project? Um, there are a few places that we will see lower costs, and this is where kind of that slush room working with the general contractors is there. Because we are a nonprofit organization, we don't have to pay sales tax on any of the materials that are purchased, um, which wasn't accounted for in any of the bids that we got from the general contractors, which will be a significant savings to us. So that's really nice. Um, part of the downside, though, of having a state grant, especially now that the um, amount that we're paying toward the building is a higher percentage than it was before when the state grant was covering 85 to 90% of it, is that there are, there are strings attached as far as prevailing wage and um, who can do the work and stuff like that. So it ties our hands a little bit for some of, some of those, those options there. There are things that we will be able to do that we can have volunteers do instead of, um, of hiring contractors to do it. So when we talk about things like painting, might even be installing flooring, countertops, cabinetry, stuff like that. If we have people that are able to do that, uh, we're working with the generals to have a couple blocks within our uh, building time frame that they give us back the building for a little bit so our volunteers can come in and prime everything and do that stuff because if we don't have to pay professional painters, um, especially in, in the rooms, like I was saying, we're probably gonna be touching up the room almost every time be between a family moving in and out. Um, we don't need to have a fortune spent on a fancy paint job for the rooms the first time when we're just going to be repainting them over and over anyway. So uh, we do have options there, but there are, there's a limitation to some of those other areas where we're able to cut those costs because of the way the funding is coming in from the state. Other questions? Well, again, I want to say thank you so much to you all for, for coming here, for uh, supporting Family Promise, for really leaning into the, the need in the community, um, for recognizing the struggle that a lot of the families have, uh, for keeping them in your prayers and thoughts, but also in your actions and in, your, uh, in, your, in what you do. So thank you so much, and uh, I'll, I'll see you around again.